Robert Condit Harvey. The Condit was a Welsh family who came to New Jersey in 1678, but instead of coming from Europe, they came from Connecticut. <laughs> my, that, uh, that, my, my father's family came from, we were just one generation in, in this country. They, he was born in Montreal. Grew up in the Penobscot Bay area of Maine. And uh, I went to, my, my schooling was all, all in the town of Bloomfield, which is between Newark and Montclair, New Jersey. I was born in East Orange and grew up in Bloomfield. My whole life, till I was in my 20s, was on a street that extended into the town where my mother had been born, her mother had been born, and her mother's mother, father had been born. And mother went to high school on that, on that street. I went to a Methodist church on that street. And uh, um, I sang in a choir on that street. And my, fam my family today were buried in a cemetery. <laughs> <laughs> that's been four miles further away, so it's it's a small world. I enlisted in the Navy in 1940 when they announced the V-7 program. That was a program which would take chaps who had had two years of college and bring them in to a a a uh, two four months training, one month training on, on on a ship as a boot seaman, and then three months training as midshipman. We called us ourselves 90 Day Wonders, uh, after which we got a, well, we commi got a commissions. I was commissioned, even though I had college, I hadn't even, even had math, I was commissioned as a, to be an engineering duty only. And uh, the reason I finally got the deck designation was I couldn't stand the idea that even if, if I were up in a well boat, the coxswain who was in, in charge of that boat could run the boat. I, as an officer, later became a, a, a lieutenant commander as an as a executive officer, could not, could not run it unless I had a deck designation. And so I had, was ambitious enough to get that deck designation and to, to, to hopefully to be the, the point where in my time I'd come, if the war lasted long enough, where I might be, be captain of a ship. Well, I was sent out to um, I was sent out to a ship whose name I've forgotten, but it was a troop transport, and it was going to be in San Diego, so I was supposed to report to say I was commissioned in June 6th of 41, married on, in Atchison, Kansas on the 10th, had a honeymoon in a, in a neighbor, friend, neighbor's cottage on halfway up Pikes Peak, and, and, took, and, and trained out to San Diego, where I went down and to see if I could find my ship. Turned out the ship was still in the Brooklyn Navy Yard, Navy Yard where it had been, been when I left the city. So they transferred me to a, uh, an old four-pipe destroyer out in Pearl Harbor, which had been modified to be a mine layer. They took taken the torpedo tanks, torpedo mount off, put mine tracks in. So instead of carrying 10 torpedoes, we carried 90 mines, each with about a, the explosive power of a torpedo. I, uh, I'd been out very late the night before with my wife. It had been my intention to get up and get down to a church just down the hill from where we lived. And uh, the alarm went off, went on. I, I turned it off, we went back to sleep. I guess we slept for half an hour or more. Then the, the attack started and we, it wasn't a matter of hearing it, we could feel it, reverberations. We were 17 miles away from the harbor. And it turned out we couldn't have seen it because there was a an extinct volcano in the in the, in the way. No, we could not see the thing. But uh, I was not willing to believe that that we would be hearing, hearing all that noise for that length of time. But when my wife asked me if we, maybe the Japanese had hit us, I said, "Oh no, we would have shot them out of the air by now." Well, we hadn't and wouldn't. But the surprise to me was when uh, a, na a, a neighbor, uh, a gal who was a neighbor of my wife in, in Ashesen, who had been working in the Navy Yard, called to, just to find out whether, how things were with us, and with the new news that the Japanese had attacked. And I said, I don't believe it. She said, an alarmist. You wouldn't remember that word, an alarmist. But uh, 
Well, my wife said, well, she says it's on the radio. So I said, turn it on. There were only two radio stations in, in Hawaii, in Honolulu. And at the time, about maybe an hour after the attack had started, one was playing chamber music and the other was playing Hawaiian music. And to me, that's a, that's a surprise that this would happen. And I, I think probably they, they say, we interrupt this program just radio stuff, to say that to the war, we're at war, we're, we're under attack. All all the ships, all men, all on on all service men are to go to their their battle stations as soon as possible. Well, I was in bed, and when my wife saw, saw me starting to jump up, she said, well, what, what, "What are you doing? Where are you going?" I said, "We're at war. I have to go to my ship." And she said, "Oh, you can't leave me. I'm your wife." <laughs> And uh, I said, well, I've got to go. And she said, well, you can't go on an empty stomach. Let me fix you some coffee. So while I was shaving, she fixed me some coffee. And when we left, the question was, when will I see you again? I don't know. How will you get the car? She didn't know. And so well, I took the car out. It was a car I'd, I'd, I'd recently bought. And uh, I drove it out there, and then we never saw it again. Somehow, those, those things were preempted for other use, and that was the end of it. But we came in at the end of a week, and my wife, alerted by the captain's wife, that we were going to be coming into Pearl Harbor to get oil and food and water and so on. And uh, she came out and she looked at me. I'd, I'd been the last man on board. They'd had to pull, haul me up on a, over the forecastle deck because, although I was a fairly strong young man, I couldn't. I was too excited to pull myself away. Pull, held me up over the deck in a very ignominious fashion. And uh, um, no way for an officer to get on a ship, you see. But um, that was it. The ship was already underway. We all both came alongside. I was the last man on board, and we must have left 15 to 20 men who didn't get out in time. I had not been called. I just learned, learned, learned the hard way. But uh, my, so here was, here was Suzanne, my wife. We, we ducked around the corner to be a little bit out of sight from the crew, and, and Suzanne said, Bob, do you have what it takes? And I said, just barely, just barely. Well, I was, it, that, that would go on for five years. I was, in the, I was in the Pacific for four and a half years before I, that was my, my duty. So when I got out on Navy Day in 19, 45, uh, I still had about six months vacation time due me from that had never been taken. Oh, on, on, the, on that morning, yes, uh, by the time I got in my car to drive out there, the, the roads were full of people just gawking. This is, this is me, mostly um, uh, the native Hawaiian people. Uh, uh, they were just curious to see what it was. So I, the roads were chock, were full. And in my haste, I had to drive, leave the roads, and I drive, drive through several people's yards, and in one case, driving through a hedge. Now, I'm, I hope the government made, made, made good for, for the cost, but I, it took me an hour to get out there. That was 17 miles. And uh, my ship had only been hit by two machine gun bullets, and those were uh, from Japanese planes flying over the ship. By the time I got there, the, the planes were, had gone. There were no more planes. There was a lot of things burning. Uh, a ship that had been near our ship, which is an old, old Spanish War battleship, that, that the whole top had been leveled and it was using it as a tar target to drop sandbags on. But the Japanese evidently thought it was a carrier. And so they sank that. By the time I got there, it was turned over. It looked like a turtle. We had we had one one gun on the on the forward deck that was an anti-aircraft gun, and it was anti-aircraft from World War One, and the, the the ammunition was down in a hold, and there were a couple of the stewards' mates there on board, and the, there was one third-class gunner's mate, showed them where the ammunition was. They had to hand it up to him. He would set, put it in the fuse pot and set it to go off at like 600 yards, and uh, then he'd load it and come around and aim and fire, and he shot down a Japanese plane. And the pilot in that plane bailed out, and uh, the same coxswain who took me out in the whale boat uh, went to, uh, to, to, to uh, pick the man up. 
and he made a, uh, and he did, he had a pistol from the, from the officer's back. And the man made a pass with his arm or something, uh, whatever it was, he shot, he shot this man. And all, all we had, all he had as a souvenir was the man's helmet as he went down. But that was, that was so sudden. Yeah. Uh, we had this one gun and we had these planes flying over. They were really doing nothing. They were, they were sinking a ship that was already sunk and was ha ha an old Fort World War, which was used for, to drop sandbags on, for target practice. So it was, you might say, wasted. That was wasted. But what they accomplished, it was so immense. It was so immense. Well, I, I, I certainly wasn't prepared to have a war that would last for four and a half years. I was on, on it long enough to become ch chief um, engineer. I was a junior engineer for a year and a half, and I became a chief, which I held for another year. And uh, that ship, the Montgomery, an old four-pipe destroyer, uh, was, we had a collision uh, when I was still on board. We were laying mines in, in, in an island called Kolamongara in the Blackett Strait on a place that was almost identical with where, where Kennedy had been, his boat had been cut in two by a Jap destroyer. A few days before, I'm, I'm sure, feel sure that he and his men were on that nearby island watching this happen to us. Uh, we, we, we hit our own ship, who they'd been dropping mines, but they were dropping them at a faster rate than they were supposed to. They, st turned, they stopped and ended and turned, and we hit them. It knocked our bow off, and uh, so we had to be we were sure that the next morning there would be the end of us because there would be Japanese planes overhead. They were already firing at us from the, from the beach on that little island. And uh, we, the next morning there were five destroyers out there. Uh, for another, uh, these were big, regular full-size destroyers. And we were hauled and, uh, back by a tugboat back to Kola Mingara, where we'd come from, uh, to, to, to do that. While we're here, I want, I want to tell you the last day of the war. This is, to me, this is the most wonderful thing that ever happened. Okay. I was, felt, felt so proud of that. We, were, we belonged to a squadron uh, that was Arleigh Burke's squadron called the Little Beavers. They, this was probably the most famous destroyer squadron. They'd been in a number of great, great fights, including one daylight between five of our destroyers and eight Japanese destroyers and a cruiser. And Arleigh, Arleigh Book's ships sank all those destroyers and left the cruiser burning and chased what was left back to Rabaul, almost to Rabaul. They couldn't go all the way because were, the, the planes would be, come out and then before they broke off the battle. But it was, it was, a, it was, a, it was a battle that earned the ship the President Unit Citation. Mm -hmm. I met, I met uh, Arleigh, Arleigh Burke when we went up to Navy Day for 1945. This is the thing I love. We, we, we came back on the first, on the first uh, uh, task force from, from Okinawa to, to, to Hawaii uh, and to Panama and then up to Norfolk and our squadron was selected to go up to, for Navy Day 1945 in Washington Navy Yard to win the President Union Citation and Halsey was there, Forrest all, Secretary Davy was there, Mark Mitchell was there, Captain Burke was there, he was still a captain, uh, and, uh, and uh, five surviving ships out of the eight in the squadron were, were up there. We were the biggest ships ever to go up the Potomac River, sailed it. And before we left Charleston, we put on our dress blues. We hadn't had dress blues on for four years. Put on our dress blues and, and, and lined up as we would uh, for a parade. And we, we were a parade because we were, every ship was at full dress where they have all the flags flying on lines from the bow to the masthead, from the masthead down to the stern. And uh, all, all that's, that's a ship at full dress. We, about, about a half an hour before we got to, to Washington Navy Yard, we were, were, were called to attention. Everybody faced port, hand salute, where were we? We were right by George Washington's burial place. George and Martha were within 50 yards. 
You can see the whole thing. I've been there before, but it was, you know, it made me so proud. And, and it was just a wonderful thing. And, and the next day I was gone, so I had more points than anybody in the ship. Well, I was uh, started out as Henry Luce's office boy, which I was for a year. And then I became the guy uh, in the sales department of life, advertising sales of life. But uh, when the war ended, I didn't, didn't stay there all that long. I, uh, it was, that was a big outfit. And uh, these were hard driving people. They were so successful that they, they hired all their competitors, best men. And so you'd have four or five men sitting in line. I had the feeling that each of them had a little knife. <laughs> anyway, I, I, it was a pretty powerful outfit. I, I'm, 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 I'm proud that I was there, though, because there's been some adverse things that have been said about Henry Luz recently, which I have done what in my in my power to correct. And uh, uh, I, I think that he did more to prepare the American people for entry to war than anybody, any other man. And I, it was as working working for his outfit that I I enlisted in the Navy when they announced the B seven program, which was for 90-day wonders to study for commissions. And this took place, this was introduced about two weeks after the German landing in, in uh, Oslo and in, in, in Denmark. It was that fast. And so I was in the Navy by December of that year and studying for commission in March. Got my commission in, in, in June. Well, one of course was the collision we had. Uh, that was memorable enough, I have to, I have to say that when that happened, my wife was in San Francisco, and our communications officer's fiance, who lived about a block away, both of them woke. This is about three in the morning. Uh, both of them had this urgent sense that something was wrong. This young fiance went up and put a thing on the calendar. When her fiance came in three or four months later with the ship, which had been repaired, she, after they'd kissed, <laughs> The next thing was, what happened at that time? And Suzette Harvey uh, was so thrown by that that she, I think, went into hysterics. She was, but here, here, here you have, at the exact same time, this, these ideas crossing that far. She knew something was wrong. And, and I don't have that. These are six cents. Uh, she could see ghosts. I never have. I, I, I think as a priest in the church, you don't do that anyway. You, you, under, you talk with people who have more experiences than you do, and you, and you, and you tend to believe them. And I, could, I, could, I, could tell, I could tell stories like that from, from now until next year. <laughs> well, I was, we, were, we, uh, we laid mines, because that was dangerous, but it was not combat. We laid mines in, 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 in the Samoan Islands and in the Fiji Islands and down in, Tong, in the Tongan Islands. We came back to the States for a brief and then went up to the Aleutian Islands and laid mines in the Aleutians. And during the time we were in the Aleutians laying mines, the Japanese already occupied two little little bits of American territory, Kiska and Attu, were, belonged to us, but the Japanese took them over and but they were, they were left, simply left there to, left there to, to die, I guess. Um, and I think most, the most act, all, all the action I was on, really, the, where, where we were shooting constantly was not on that first ship, which was kept in, in dangerous areas, but, uh, and in, in great danger sometimes, but not shooting daily as we did on the other ships I was on. Uh, my first ship was, 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 my first ship came to an end when it, 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 went into a little atoll I'd never heard of and dropped the anchor. And I had seen them the day before they sank. They, they, my, my ship was coming into a, a harbor when my, the ship, the second ship was on, was going out. And they must have recognized the number because here in my, my engineering gang, all waving to me. Every one of them I could identify and I hadn't seen them for over a year. And uh, 15 minutes later, I thought they, they, they were hit of mine and, and, and they were all killed. But it wasn't, it wasn't uh, 50 minutes later, it was two or three days later because a, a man who was on that a mine sweep that saw this happen 
His son is the rector of my church, the, the church that Marguerite and I started 25 years ago. And, and uh, it's, it's a small world. But these, these men died. The second ship I saw on had, had some great guys who were killed when the kamikaze hit it. But it happened after I left it. The third ship I was on, where I became the exact, had been hit by a torpedo, but the thing did not detonate before I came on board. It just left a bum in the side of the ship. Um, but at Okinawa, that's, uh, when, when the kamikaze started it, that was, and I was in watching the greatest battle that ever took place, the, the Surigao State Battle. I, I just watched the whole thing, sitting, sitting on a bollard of the midship as the head of the repair party. You could see these five shells from every battleship and cruiser coming over, just like flying ducks and men settling on two. We could see the Japanese battleships while we were torpedoing them. And uh, I, went, I was able the next morning just to look at a recognition book. I say, this is the Fuso, and that's the Armashiro, and those are the ships we sang. Just by, and we could, they were close enough. They were not more than a half mile away. Uh, that was a, an action for which I was given the Bronze Star and several other men on the ship. Uh, there was a, an LSC had been hit by a kamikaze plane and it was burning. And uh, the captain was a reserve captain, didn't know too much about, hadn't been in very long. He was going northward and the wind was coming from the east and men started jumping off. And he, he after about 15 minutes, still going that direction, he stopped and dropped the hook, and the ship, the LST, turned into the wind, and the fire which was on the fantail went out. So the, the ship never did sink. But my captain sent me back to the fantail with the, with the helmet on, or the, the ears on, to, 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 as we say, con the ship. I would back upwind of, of a, I, I spent all afternoon backing upwind, drifting down on a group of men in the water, backing up and drifting down another. We, we, we spent all afternoon just drifting down on men. We, we were blowing three miles an hour, so nobody could swim that fast. So we would come down, uh, talk to them, and then we'd have ladders and fire hoses with a hard, you know, and ropes, and everything else to pull them out. And the people, people who would jump in and to take people out to help people who couldn't swim. And so we got 287 men. As far as we know, it was everybody in the water. I think three of them died on board that night, but uh, the rest were, so we, we felt very proud about that. Yeah, all the time. Yeah, never, the time never went by when we didn't get it. letters and pictures and so on. Well, I, I left the next day. Uh, my, my wife was anticipating that my coming in, she stayed up in Annapolis with some friends. I went up there and met her there. And we went from there back, back to, uh, I, we had already had, I had the celebration to meet Halsey and mention, you know, to see these men, it's just, just, just marvelous. Mm -hmm. I, have a, I have a painting up in my study, a painting of Admiral Halsey, which appeared, there's a copy of it right there on one of those books, which appeared uh, on the cover of Look Magazine. You may remember Look Magazine, it's sort of like life, in August of 1943. And it was painted, the cover was painted by my wife's brother who was an illustrator, one of the very best. I think probably next to Norman Rockwell, he was probably the best known. He did about 70, about 200 Saturday evening post, post covers. And, uh, but here was this portrait of Halsey, which uh, is a marvelous picture. It, it was the best, best of the, the Admiral. And he told me that I met, met him after the war and he told me that it was his favorite. And my brother-in-law told me that uh, Halsey's Mother wanted to buy it, but he wouldn't sell it. He just kept it. I, I still have it up here. I'm, I'm in hopes I can send, send it down to the Naval Academy Museum or something like that. But uh, it, it, it was, it's, uh, things like that you don't forget. Well, I had worked for time, and I expected to go back, and, and I did go back for, for a while, but uh, um, the, the, the job they gave to, to me was a, it was a good job. If I'd stayed, it would have been well. But it was in charge of uh, merchandising out in, in, in an office that covered Pittsburgh and Cleveland. And uh, it, I was there for six months. 
I realized I, I couldn't even find a room for myself, let alone my wife and, and little boy and uh, the s second son who was already halfway here. <laughs> uh, and uh, so I, I, I left and left, went to Atchison and worked for my wife's father for a year. And uh, we, we figured that was too much. He wasn't ready to re retire and turn the business over and I wasn't, I, I had no interest in merchandising clothing and, and uh, you know, so I, I went back to New York and, uh, and, and st took a job which had been offered to me when I was still in uniform, uh, working for a Wall Street firm that my father did business with and liked very well. Uh, he was their advertising agent and uh, I, he never forgot the fact that when I was missing, unheard from after Pearl Harbor, the man who founded that firm, his name was Calvin Bullock, found, would call my dad every day to find out how, how he was. So and he, he took me in to meet the son who was on the head of the firm and, and uh, I was offered a job then, which I turned down because I was interested in life at the time. But I, I went, got that state and I loved it. That was the mutual fund business for 10 years. People would say to me, do you, do you feel guilty about uh, this, all this? No, it was a good business. It's a very faith that people need to have something like this for small investors to be able to, to save money for their futures. Now, I, I was in the security business for 10 years after World War II. It was 1940, 1946 that I, that I, I went into the security business. 1956, when I left it, was ordained in the ministry. There has been, yes. Uh, one, one of them is interesting. That, that, uh, a chap, you, you, you remember the Swan House in Atlanta. Uh, my, my shipmate on my first ship, he was four years older than I, named Ed Inman, was, his father built the Swan House. And he was, he was a adolescent boy when they built that building there. And uh, Ed Inman, uh, when it had gone to Georgia Tech, uh, unlike most grads, he, for some reason or other, he didn't, he asked them to take his name off their mailing list. And for the rest of his life, he moved back and forth between Santa Barbara and uh, someplace in Florida. Um, and, uh, but he was um, an interesting guy, but he, uh, he was from that family. And I, I went, I, I saw that, that he was going, that he had died and been buried. I went down and met, met his widow and his grandchild and met, met Ivan Allen, who, who, uh, whose secretary was uh, some relation of Ed Inman's. And uh, I, I said to, to this boy, did your grandfather ever tell you about his war? No, well, I could tell you a lot about him. And he was a hero. I think any child who's, who's had a, an ancestor, a, a father, or, uh, should be able to think of his father as having served the human race rather than having been a bully. Uh, I, I've been to two meetings of the Pearl Harbor survivors, but um, it was too far. Uh, this before I, two, two years ago I had a stroke, and of course I can't drive, I can't even walk without a walker. But uh, I can, for, fortunately I can speak, I can think, I can write, I can sing. <laughs> but um, uh, uh, I, no, I've just been in a couple of their meetings, and uh, I, I think they're, they're, I think they're good, they're good, good, really. But the, the, the his, the, there's a World War II roundtable that I've been to, and, and I think they, I think they do a great deal, both for themselves and for children in schools and so on. I'm going I'm to tell about when I was a schoolboy. I remember that that a veteran of World War One came to visit us, bringing with him a little a little homing pigeon that had saved a regiment in World War I. This little bird's name was Charami, dear friend. And this little bird was still living. It had been hit by some, I think, uh, flak from uh, area, shooting at the birds, or maybe, maybe birds had attacked on the way. But this, this homing pigeon was released by, by, people, by a, a regiment that had gotten lost in, 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 a, in a pocket of Germans. And, it, it, it let, let, let the people outside know where they were so they could be saved when they were. So this, this little bird was taken, taken all around the world to, to be 
shown to school children. And it made an impression on me. Liberty is something that is a necessity for all people.